Hello, I'm Sally from the Advancement Team and welcome to this year's Brotherton Circle event, our first on campus since 2019. Leeds was founded upon the generosity of individual benefactors and for more than a century, legacies have helped to shape it. Our Brotherton Circle is a community of over 300 members from the UK and overseas who have generously chosen to remember Leeds in their will. The Circle recognises the importance of legacy gifts and gives us an opportunity to thank you for remembering Leeds in your will. This afternoon, a century of inspiration will take us from Lord Brotherton's first purchase to the John Evan Bedford Library of Furniture History. I'm very pleased to hand over to Joanne and Rhiannon from the Special Collections team to guide us through the afternoon. Uh, good afternoon everybody. We've really got the pleasure of inviting you here today into what is usually our group study area for Special Collections. Um, we have the pleasure of working in this magnificent building every day to make the collections that are housed within it accessible for all. And I'm hoping that the two stories that we share with you this afternoon um, show you that that is the reality of our work here. I'm going to quickly hand back to Rhiannon who will start us off on the first of our two stories. Thank you, Joanne. Good afternoon, everyone. This year, Special Collections at the University is celebrating a really important anniversary. It's exactly 100 years since Lord Brotherton of Wakefield bought his first rare book and established what was to become the Brotherton Collection. Edward Allen Brotherton was born in Ardwick in Manchester, the other side of the Pennines, in 1856. He was the eldest of uh, Sarah and Theophilus Brotherton's nine children. And when he was 22, his mother gave him £200 to start his own business and suggested that he advertise for partners. And very soon, Dyson Brothers and Brotherton had their first premises in Wakefield. And Brotherton's aim was to make chemical ma manufacturing processes as efficient and economical as possible. And in just three years, he'd earned enough money to buy out the Dysons and Brotherton & Co. was born. Lord Brotherton was an extremely generous and philanthropic man who shared his success with his family, his workers, and also the general public. But it wasn't until he was in his late 60s that his interest in rare books was piqued by the proposed sale of a medieval manuscript. And it was in February 1922, exactly 100 years ago, that the mid-15th century manuscript of the Wakefield Mystery Plays, also known as the Townley Cycle, was offered for sale at Sotheby's in London. But here, I must introduce the other key player in the Brotherton story, and this is the poet and writer Dorothy Una Ratcliffe, or D-U-R, as she was also known. Now, she was married to Lord Brotherton's nephew and heir, Charles, and Lord Brotherton was um, a widower, and Dorothy helped with him with his public duties, acting as Lady Mayoress when he was Lord Mayor of Leeds. Now, as soon as the sale of the Townley manuscript was announced, Dorothy received many communications from North Country men and women of letters asking if she would engage Lord Brotherton's help in buying and keeping this manuscript in the county of Yorkshire. The town clerk of Wakefield also wrote to Brotherton directly, suggesting a subscription list be opened to secure the manuscript, and Lord Brotherton be mayor of Wakefield, and so uh, matters to do with the city were very close to his heart. Now, Dorothy recounted what happened next in her address to the council at the University of Leeds some ten years later. So on the 7th of February, 1922, Lord Brotherton and Dorothy went to London and visited Mr Gilson, who was keeper of manuscripts at the British Museum. And they learned that the museum, although keen to acquire this manuscript of the plays, could not afford to bid more than £1,400. So on February the 8th, Lord Brotherton, Mr Gilson and Dorothy consulted with Mr Dring of Quaritch, the booksellers, and they decided Mr Dring should bid up to £1,400 on behalf of the British Museum, and if that didn't secure the manuscript, Mr Dring would then bid up to £3,250 on behalf of Lord Brotherton. He did not advise paying a penny more. And Lord Brotherton will have been alert to that, being an entrepreneurial man. However, at the auction, things took an unexpected turn. Dr A.S.W. Rosenbach of Philadelphia, I might be some booze in the room at that stage. Uh, a dealer of rare books and manuscript was in the room, acting on behalf of the Californian magnate uh, millionaire, Mr. Henry Huntington. And the bidding rose and rose, and it reached the agreed limit 
of £3,250, Mr Dring put up one more bid, another £100, in a desperate attempt to secure this manuscript for Lord Brotherton. But Dr Rosenbach, who uh, came to be known as the terror of the auction rooms, was undeterred and the hammer fell. £3,400, that's about 100000 I suppose, in today's money. So here on the left is an image of that manuscript, and that is now H.M. Huntington Manuscript, number one in the Huntington Library in California. The one that got away. <laughs> but um, seeing his niece-in-law's disappointment, Lord Brotherton promised to take Dorothy to Quaritch and choose another book. And the next day, they selected a perfect copy of Andrew Marvell's miscellaneous poems, this first edition from uh, 1681. And Marvel was a Yorkshire man, also a member of Parliament for Hull, facts that won't have been lost on Lord Brotherton. And on the right is an image of that book. And that book became the first volume in the Brotherton collection. Dorothy describes how initially she and her uncle played many a spirited game of long auction bowls. But they soon realised they didn't have the specialist knowledge or understanding of commercial values to build up a really great library. So in 1923, the following year, Lord Brotherton engaged the help of Mr J. Alexander Symington as his librarian with Dorothy's approval. And the pace at which they acquired material is quite staggering. By 1930, the year Lord Brotherton died, the collection contained over 35,000 books and pamphlets, 4,000 deeds, 30,000 letters and 400 other manuscripts. I think this averages out at about 30 items being bought every day for eight years. They looked out for specific items that they wanted to buy, as well as purchasing whole libraries when they came up at auction. And Lord Brotherton welcomed researchers and other interested people to his home at Roundhay Hall in North Leeds to look at his collection, all the while considering what he might eventually do with this ever-growing library of rare books and manuscripts. So by the mid to late 1920s, Brotherton and Symington had already gathered a large and important collection. Symington wrote a guide to the art and literature held at Roundhay Hall, and he made it very clear in the introduction that it included only a few of the most special items in the collection, and that even the catalogue ran to over 30 volumes. So Brotherton and Symington met with other collectors and librarians, and after conversations with Mr Wise at the Ashley Library and Dr Guppy of the Rylands Library, Brotherton decided that his ambition was to create a library that in years to come could rival not only the Rylands, but the Bodleian in Oxford, the Vatican Library, the Bibliothèque Nationale. Now, at the same time that he was doing all that thinking, different conversations were happening at the recently established University of Leeds. The university had real storage issues, something that is still true for us today, uh, with its own collection of books. It needed new facilities and an ambitious plan modelled on the reading room of the British Museum had been drawn up, and you can see some of the images there. The problem was the university needed £100,000 to realise its ideas. The Vice-Chancellor at the time was um, James Bailey, and he knew that Brotherton was a keen supporter of the university, and so he decided to ask him for the entire amount. This was no small ask. I mean, in today's money, that's about £6 million. But Brotherton had been a generous uh, philanthropist throughout his life, so when Bailey asked for the money for the building of the new university library, it is perhaps not surprising that he agreed. On the 24th of June 1930, there was a ceremony which Lord Brotherton himself laid the foundation stone. He gave a speech, which I think is worth quoting at length. As one who has spent the greater part of his life in Yorkshire, I am proud of our county. As a citizen of Leeds, I am proud of the city, and I believe in giving our young people the best chance to make its future even better than its past. I like to think that all students will have the opportunity to wander freely through rooms of a great library. But a great library is in a great university is a trust for the nation at large and should not be looked upon as it's exclusively available for its own students. I hope that in the course of time, this library building may be rich enough in books of all kinds to attract scholars from all parts of Great Britain and from countries abroad. And he finished his speech by confirming that in addition to the money he would be giving for the library building, his desire was that his collection of rare books and manuscripts would also be housed in the library and that this would be held by the university in perpetual trust for the nation. Sadly, the laying of that foundation stone was Brotherton's last public appearance. In September 1930, he fell ill, and on the 21st of October, 
he died. His magnificent library was built, and in his will, Lord Brotherton left an additional £100,000 to the university, which ensured the further development of his collection. And in 1935, it was officially handed over to the library, and 6th of October 1936, the Brotherton Library was opened, with the Brotherton Room as designated space for his collection. Lord Brotherton's gift can be seen as the foundation collection of what we now know as special collections at the University of Leeds. There were already some rare books and manuscripts in the University Library, but the sheer size of the collection that Brotherton uh, donated meant the library now had a very substantial collection of rare and unique material. Incidentally, the first medieval manuscript um, acquired by the University Library in 1925 was the Manuel de Peche, an Anglo-Norman verse treatise, and it was presented by a group of um, local benefactors, one of whom was Lord Brotherton. <laughs> His generosity established Leeds University Library as a final home for many other significant private collections. Individuals like Blanche Leggett Lee, former Lady Mayoress of Leeds, donated her exceptional collection of historic cookery books and manuscripts here in 1939. In the same year, Harold Whitaker of Halifax presented his collection of maps, atlases and road books, a collection at the time considered the most valuable of its kind in private hands. More recently, significant organisations and institutions have deposited their collections with us for safekeeping. For example, we look after the Ripon Cathedral Library and the Dean and Chapter Archive, and books and extensive archival material from the Yorkshire Archaeological and Historical Society are lodged with us. So as a result of these and many other donations, acquisitions and deposits, the wider holdings of special collections at Leeds now stand at something like 300,000 printed books, hundreds of thousands of manuscripts and pieces of archival material, as well as artworks, coins and museum objects. When we opened our bespoke exhibition space, the Treasures of the Brotherton Gallery, in 2016, we were already looking ahead to the anniversary in 2022 and what we might do to celebrate 100 years of this fabulous collection. And we'd hoped to, we would plan a big in-gallery display on the life and legacy of Lord Brotherton, but our exhibition schedule, like so many others, was seriously affected by the pandemic. So instead, we developed this. Um, an online feature telling the story of Lord Brotherton, which we will hope will bring him to the wider attention we feel he deserves. And in it, we feature some of the key items acquired by him and also more recent purchases enabled by the endowment. And you'll be able to see some of these later this afternoon when we go downstairs and visit the Treasures Gallery. And the generosity of Lord Brotherton and continued financial support of the family means the collection continues to grow and inspire new generations. Early career researchers are supported through the Brotherton Fellowship Scheme. New poets are encouraged through the Brotherton Poetry Prize. But I'd like to end my talk today by returning to Lord Brotherton's words as he laid that foundation stone in the library that bears his name, that a great library in a great university is a trust for the nation at large. And a century after that first rare book purchase, the Brotherton collection continues to thrive, and most importantly, it's accessible to everyone. 2022 marks another important moment in uh, the history of our department. The opening of the refurbished Brotherton Research Centre, where we are today, and the new John Bedford Room, which you will visit later. So, I'm now going to hand over to Joanne to tell you more about another remarkable man whose legacy has been transformational. Thank you. In 2018, John Bedford sent a handwritten letter to Special Collections, and John, he wasn't familiar to me. As far as I knew, he had not visited the library before, and he didn't have any close association with the university. But I discovered that John had been an antique dealer, a very successful one at that. And he was also aware of and involved with the research and associated outputs of Dr. Mark Westgarth, working on the history of the antiques trade. And I'd been working with um, Dr. Westgarth since 2014, supporting his research and accepting donations of antique dealer archives as a new area of research resources for the library. Now, John wasn't contacting the library as an antique dealer, but as a rare book and manuscript collector. And John had amassed a collection on furniture history over a period of 40 years. In his letter to me, he described some of the highlights of the collection, how it had been used by researchers over the years, 
and mention senior figures at other institutions who would endorse the status of the collection as a significant research resource. And I should say that at this point, um, special collections is approached frequently um, with offers of personal libraries, and it can be very challenging as we do have to decline some of the offers. Personal libraries are formed by people for many different reasons, and they can often duplicate um, holdings that we have from other personal libraries as well. And collections being held in a research library are very expensive to manage. Um, so the gifts that we are offered are not necessarily going to be free. So saying yes is a very big investment for us to make as a university. If we already have a copy of a publication, what is it that the new offer is making special? And that's very hard to discuss with somebody who's had a lifetime passion for collecting. But Rhiannon and I were intrigued by John's letter. And Mark helped persuade us, as well as the numerous different people that were starting to petition us about the collection. And John was quite poorly at this time, and it was really important to him that his library would be taken care of after his death. So we arranged to visit John and to look at the collection with an open mind. And so off we flew to Guernsey, where John had lived for a number of years. So Rhiannon and I made a plan. We'd catch an early flight out of Manchester in the morning, arrive by early lunch time, spend a few hours looking at the collection with John to get a feel for it, and then fly back the same day to ponder. And John had sent us a summary list of the collection um, so that we had a sense of the areas that would be of most interest to us. And there were a lot of rare books. Rhiannon would take care of that. And I would concentrate on looking at the archive material. And at this time, John had a living care worker. The trip was very nearly cancelled because of John's health, but he persevered. And when we arrived, we got straight to it. John had one of his favourite books laid out ready to show us and said, this is a lady's amusement. It was valued at... <laughs> um, and Rhiannon and I looked down the drawing room and we could see we were in for a real treat that day. The house was a labyrinth of rooms with the collection running throughout it. And it was going to be very hard to get a sense of the collection in the time that we had. And we were thinking, is this something that we would want to cherry pick the really fine items to join others in the um, Brotherton? Um, did the library need to remain intact? And what did John want to happen more than anything? And a friend of John's came to help show us around that day as well, so that we could at least see every location during the visit. And then, unexpectedly, I was informed that John's trustees would also be joining us on the day. And all of a sudden, a casual getting a sense of a collection turned into a whole different ball game of a day. And Rhiannon got to focus on unpicking the highlights of the collection, as well as getting a sense for the quality of what John hadn't highlighted. Um, plus, it was important to get a sense of how all the material was connected and why John had chosen to collect the items that he had. And meanwhile, I met with the trustees and John. John was looking for a home for the collection in its entirety. I was informed that the library was provided for in John's will. He understood the costs associated with preservation and access, and he was very clear that he wanted a home for the collection where it would be accessible and doing good for research. What John considered to be part of the library was also made clear to me that day. There were a number of artworks and objects that would also need to be preserved. These were key items that he believed had connection to the books and manuscripts, or in some cases, they were his favorite things. So the day was a whirlwind for us. Rhiannon and I knew that we had seen something very special, but it was on Guernsey. <laughs> it was big. It spoke to many of our collection's strengths, but it would bring new ones that we'd not explored before. Did we have the space? How would we get it catalogued? but instinctively we knew that we wanted to make something happen. The photos here give the game away. <laughs> there were a few more steps before we got to this point. After that first visit to Guernsey, I wrote back to John and I said we would love to receive a gift of the collection if John thought that we would be a good home. I outlined our ambitions and our heritage. John's wishes for the collection reminded me of Brotherton in many ways. Access was his desire, and he wanted the work to be with a trusted repository. He also understood 
that collections are expensive to manage. Um, now, I'm not sure that John ever got to read my letter. I was informed quite soon after that that he'd passed away. But his trustees got in touch very quickly. John had had a wonderful day when Rihanna and I visited. He appreciated the genuine interest in the collection content, Rihanna's knowledge and our shared vision. His trustees wanted the collection to come to Leeds and our next step was to outline what would be involved in that, the steps and the costs um, for taking a very substantial collection on. And it was at this point that I began to work with the advancement team here at the university. This was a really substantial gift that we were being given, not just in terms of the value of the collection itself, but the door seemed open to explore other opportunities for support to make the collection accessible. So Rhianna and I went back to Guernsey um, to unpick the detail. What was truly part of the collection? How many metres of stock would we need to house? Was there a particular order that would need to be preserved for the material? Were there any finding aids or indexes that would be need to be maintained? How had John arranged his collection? We needed to think about were there any signs of damage, mould and insects? What types of expertise would be needed to make the material accessible? Who would want to use this material? Were these people already at the university? Would we be attracting people from outside the university? What links would there be for teaching with this collection? What was the financial value of the collection itself and how would that impact the logistics of the physical move? And what different companies would we need to employ to work with us? So we had calculators, tape measures, lots of head scratching going on and drawing up plans while we were there. And back at the Brotherton, we created a plan of the costs and the steps that would need to get the collection to Leeds and get it catalogued. And the trustees at this point agreed to cover all the costs of a two year cataloguing project. So the decant itself happened in two stages. I think I definitely got the easy job. Um, we hired Momart, who are a specialist art courier company, and we created the objects that would need to come here in the framed artworks. There was a lot of paperwork to prepare to ensure the items could come into the country through customs. And I was there to supervise the packing and the crew drove the van back to Leeds via ferry. And I flew back to Leeds to meet them the next day on site and check that everything was still as it had left Guernsey. Now, Rhiannon went to Guernsey for an entire week to oversee the packing of the books and manuscripts. This was a major undertaking. White, in the picture in the van, um, is a company based in Guernsey, and they had a crew to pack the boxes. Everything had to be labelled so that it could be shelved in order when it got back to Leeds. But the bo books were not coming straight back to Leeds. It would be over a month before they arrived. And this was because they were sent to a quarantine facility in Oxford called Harwells. Now, it's vitally important to us from a preservation point of view that we protect all of the collections that are in our care. Many insects love to eat paper and we have lots of systems and processes in place to minimise the chances of insects getting to roam through our stacks in the library. And new material, especially that coming from people's homes, attics, offices, garages, they can have all sorts of creepy crawlies that are not welcome visitors for us. So Harwell's quarantined the books and manuscripts and it means that the majority of the collection was monitored for a number of weeks to see if there were any pests and if nothing would materialise, the collection could transfer to the library. If anything did materialise, the papers would be frozen and kill, kill the bugs. So we knew that some material had been in an outbuilding for a number of years and was infected with mould and Harwells would be able to decontaminate the papers to make them safe. So that's what happened. Weeks of quarantine, some freezing, mould removal. And for the time in between that, we were very busy here. Shelves were being pitched in the stores to be the right heights for the incoming material. And so that when it arrived, it could be decanted straight onto the shelves in the order that we had planned. On the left here is an image of our special collections reading room, as it was known, um, the space that you're sat in right now. And the Bedford trustees visited the Brotherton after we agreed that we'd wanted to work together. 
And coming here was an opportunity for them to learn more about us before concrete commitments were made. I knew that it was very likely that the trust would, be, would provide the resource to make the collection accessible, but I also remember conversations Rhiannon and I had during that first visit with John's friend and care worker. These people were very close to John. They had the utmost respect for him and John trusted them very much. These conversations had made me believe that John had wished for more to happen with his collection. And so I put this to the trustees. And I was encouraged by them to come up with a shopping list of activities. And um, I was very, very pleased that I was told to be ambitious. Now, in all the years that I've worked here at the Brotherton, I've felt that the service has been limited by the physical facilities that we have. We're in a magnificent library, but that can disguise the real needs of our users as services evolve over the decades. And we hold some of the most outstanding collections in the world at the Brotherton and have become increasingly adept at showcasing them in the Treasures Gallery for public audiences. But our impact in teaching and research could and should do much, much more. And the facilities would always make this challenging. So I put to the trustees the option of creating the John Bedford Room, a space primarily for manuscript and rare book, hands-on access in teaching and research. Amazingly, they said yes in late 2019, and the demolition started in summer 2021. Our plan was to redesign this entire space, the Brotherton Research Centre, incorporating the John Bedford Room. But the project would not only see the building of the new room, it was a complete transformation of all of our public areas of the special collections operation. We used architects that have built other libraries on campus. They understood that the spec of this space needs to remain high. They understood that special collections and archives can be quite intimidating um, spaces. We have lots of rules, lots of security. And we did undertake some user consultation before the project started to understand some of those barriers that people face to using the service, hoping that we could minimise these without compromising on professional standards. So the John Bedford Room builds out into the atrium of the 1990s extension of this library. The space was designed for up to 40 people, and what I love now is that the students can look up from the West Building and see their peers using this space in a way that they just couldn't do before. And so Special Collections feels a lot more connected to the rest of the library. Our main aims were to create a welcoming space that was flexible. Over the years, we've seen more and more people want to work in groups, but we didn't have the configuration to support that. We were designed for lots of silent study. So now we're encouraging people to be noisy in this room and work collaboratively. We still do have silent individual study um, with some soundproofing for um, those people that do want that more traditional feel. Um, but all of, like, of the furniture that we have purchased is very flexible so that we can configure the space to work differently every day depending on who is booked in to view different types of material. And the Special Collections Reading Room, as this space was known, used to be focused on books and manuscript consultation and we've adapted the space now to accommodate all the different formats of heritage material that we care for within the service, including the university art collection and object collections. We don't want people's research and exploration to be limited by a particular format. Now somebody can request to look at all different types of material in one sitting. It was an opportunity to have that space to restore and display some of the Brotherton family items that have not been displayed for a long time. And for John Bedford, we've been able to display some of the items that he displayed himself in his home. We've taken um, patterns from the books in the collection to create the window manifestations in the space. Another of our aims was to increase the amount of teaching taking place with the collections. And we are already seeing the increase in tutors wanting to bring students to the space and also explore ideas around how they turn students into independent researchers who will use collections when they're not being directed by a tutor. And the pandemic itself gave us some advantages that we didn't foresee. We're now experimenting with virtual reading rooms and equipment to support this, enabling global collaborations to take place from within this room in real time. The Bedford Trustees' support continued beyond the building. 
They recognise the value of supporting researchers to engage with the collection more fully. And they are supporting a series of postdoctoral fellowships to work with the Bedford Collection over the next few years. And I'm incredibly grateful to the trustees for putting their faith in us. They gave us free reign to develop the project in the way that we knew our users would benefit most fully from the spaces with an eye to the future. John Bedford's name is above the door, but in reality there's very little presence of his collection in the space on a day-to-day -day basis, which could seem unusual, um, and perhaps it would have seemed unusual to John himself. But as custodians, we're responsible for the long-term care as well as access to the collections, and it's in our activities with the collection rather than treating them as a permanent exhibit that creates the legacy for John, for his passion and for collecting and learning. And with that, I come right up to date. We have plans for a full exhibition on furniture history in the Treasures Gallery for 2024, and our av advocacy efforts continue to bring more researchers to Leeds to work with this remar remarkable collection. The project also inspired us to build, build on our ambitions for improved care and access to the collections more broadly. And the Arts and Humanities Research Council awarded us a major grant to upgrade our storage facilities after they've seen what we could do out here. And that's a live project just behind this wall. We've got an entire refit of one of our stores happening. So two stories over 100 years, but I think with shared principles and values of sharing knowledge and recognising the transformational effect heritage can have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna.